Good evening and welcome to our Vesper service. Tonight's psalm is number 25 when we get there and our hymn is number 145 when we get there. The canticle for the evening is the Nunc Dimittis and so turn to page 41 in your hymnal and please stand with me and we will begin Vespers.
Luke, the 23rd chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for certain sedition made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Here ended the reading. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to thee, O Lord. We sing our hymn.
peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The thing that we need to pay attention to most of all in our gospel lesson for today is Pilate repeatedly saying that he finds no fault in Jesus. He says it in chapter 23, verse 4, where he said to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Then later on, after he sends him to Herod, and Herod sends him back to Pilate, Pilate gathers the chief priests and the Sanhedrin, and he says, you have brought this man to me as one that perverted the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof you accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Then, Further on down in verse 22, the third time after they say, crucify him, crucify him, Pilate says, why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Now, what we have to take into account here is the different motivations going on. The Sanhedrin was composed of people who were habitually opponents and enemies of Jesus. They could not accept him, would not accept him, and had plotted his death. They are among the unbelieving and the wicked of the world. Pilate is not quite so invested. On the one hand, he wants to kind of, uh, he doesn't want to cave in to the Sanhedrin because they gall him. Uh, he wants to set Jesus free because he has a Roman sense of justice, but it remains to be seen whether he has the courage of his convictions. So, we have the Sanhedrin, who when Jesus confesses that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and not only is he the Christ, the Son of God, but that soon the tables would be turned and he would be on the judge's throne and they would be the ones judged. When he confesses this boldly before them, they, in their unbelieving hearts, can only condemn him for speaking blasphemy. Because the Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so it is that in their unbelief, their eyes are blinded, and when Jesus confesses the holy truth of God about himself, they respond by considering it blasphemy. So Jesus is going to go to the cross, confessing himself to be Christ, the Son of God. And when Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, uh, you have said so. In other words, yes, I am. And so Jesus will go to the cross as the king of the Jews. Pilate will even write a placard and put it up above Jesus on the cross. And the placard will say in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So, what's really going on here? What's really going on is the plan of God 
being worked out and fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. If we go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 22, the big story of the testing of Abraham. Take your only son, your son whom you love, and offer him up as a sacrifice to me on one of the mountains that I will show you of. So Abraham and his son Isaac, the son of the promise, they are heading up to Mount Moriah, the same mountain where the temple later stood. All right? And as they're going up, Isaac says to his father, well, here's the wood and here's the fire, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And they went both of them together. So Abraham speaks a word of faith. He doesn't have any idea how this is going to turn out. But he knows somehow or other that his son has a future. He doesn't know what God is up to. But even if he has to raise him from the dead, he knows that God's promise will not fail. But it's having a terrible effect on Abraham. But Abraham speaks this word of faith. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so they get there. He puts Isaac on the uh, altar. He's about to take the knife and plunge it into his son. The angel of the Lord stops him and uh, and says, now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifts up his eyes, and he looks, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. This ram that is offered in the stead of Isaac is a type and a sign of the coming Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then further on, Abraham calls the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said today, the mount, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. In other words, the messianic sacrifice, the redemption of the world, will be seen in the mountain of the Lord. And so he names the place in hope of the coming Messiah. And then the angel of the Lord speaks to him and tells him the covenant promise, which ends with, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The seed of Abraham is Christ, and in thy seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, what is the New Testament counterpart of this? It's in the first chapter of St. John's Gospel. In verse 29, after John the Baptist has testified of Christ to the Sanhedrin, who sent a delegation out to interrogate him, he says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And everything in St. John's Gospel flows from this wonderful confession of John, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You see, this is what is really going on in the passion of Christ. Jesus is not a victim of accidental circumstances. There are not little whoopses that have happened that have landed him in a bad place. But everything that is happening 
is in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and everything that is happening is part of the plan of God in order to redeem the world. Let's look a little bit closer at this by taking a peek at a few verses in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 verse 7. It says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. So there we see that the servant of the Lord, the Christ of God, will be cut off from the land of the living, and he will be cut off for the transgression of my people. He was stricken for the transgressions of of my people. It goes on and it says, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. This is exactly what Pontius Pilate was saying over and over again. He had not done anything worthy of death. So he is going to the cross, not bearing his own sins, but he is going to the cross, bearing our sins. He is the bearer of sins. There is no violence, neither was there deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. So this is the Lord's work. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall prolong his days. He shall see his seed, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. You see what a wonderful thing is going on here? God's redemptive purpose is being realized and brought into being by Jesus in his suffering, his passion, his crucifixion, and his death. And so in Isaiah 53 here, we see, as, as it were, a vivid technicolor picture of the crucifixion of Jesus 725 years before it actually happened. All right, but we have to look at a few more passages of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We learn that in verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath, com and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So in his suffering and death, God is at work in Christ, reconciling the world, making atonement, bringing redemption and salvation so that our sins are not imputed to us and we, the preachers of the gospel, the holy Christian church and the people of God, to us has been committed the word of reconciliation, the gospel of the salvation of God in Christ. Then he says, now, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. God has done all the work for your reconciliation. When you believe in him, you receive all the blessings of that reconciliation. For he hath made him to be sin.
for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here is the great exchange. Jesus takes our sins upon himself. He becomes sin for us, even though he personally is guilty of no sin. Yet, taking our sins, he bears them. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, and that what do we receive? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him, so that all of Christ's holy righteousness is imputed or reckoned to those who believe in him. But we need to explore a passage in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 15 says this, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So we have a high priest who knows how to sympathize with us. He, he has been tempted like we have been tempted in all points, yet he is without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace. You see, Christ is seated at the right hand of God, having made reconciliation and atonement for all sinners. He is now seated at God's right hand, and we have a throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly, confidently, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What a wonderful passage because it speaks about the sinlessness of Christ and yet how he, as a high priest, offered himself in our stead to pay for our sins. And now we have a throne of grace where we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One more passage, 1 Peter chapter 2. St. Peter uh, says these following words. Christ also suffered for us, verse 21, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. There we have a reference to Isaiah 53, verse 9. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. So Jesus had no sin of his own, but he bare our sins and he suffered and died for our sins so that we might live unto righteousness. For by his stripes you have been healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So here Peter talks about the same thing, lifting up the innocence and sinlessness of Jesus, but that this innocent, sinless Jesus is going to the cross. He is going to the place of punishment. He is going there as the confessed Son of God and Christ. He is going there, as Pilate says it, as the King of the Jews. And when he is nailed to the cross, a signboard is nailed to it with him. 
This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And so our Lord Jesus here is acting and working as our Redeemer, making the once for all atoning sacrifice that reconciles sinful man with God. And so today we rejoice at the words of Pontius Pilate, I find no fault in him because he took our faults upon himself and he paid the ultimate price for our sins. Amen. The peace of God that passeth all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Vespers continues at the bottom of page 42 with the versicle leading into the Nunc Dimittis. Please stand. Let my prayers be set before thee as incense and the lifting up of we have no strength. Keep us both outwardly and inwardly that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak. May the prayers of them that cry unto thee in any tribulation or distress graciously come before thee, so that in all their necessities 
they may mark and receive thy manifold help and comfort through Jesus Christ our Lord who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost ever one God world without end O God from whom all holy desires all good counsels and all just works do proceed Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that we, being defended by thee from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.